You know, as Jerry gets introduced to OxyContin and he starts to go deeper and deeper into the drug world or into taking drugs, um, and uh, the the light in the house gets increasingly sort of sketchy and darker and uh, like the windows are more closed up and um, uh, it, it eventually it leads to drug addiction um, and Emily sort of succumbs and there's a there's a kind of a breaking point when uh, he comes home all high and Emily just freaks out and says she can't take this shit anymore. And we did this shot where we built a little rig. My key grip, Jimmy Shelton, built a uh, kind of a rolling rig that Tom could stand on and we could rig the camera on and the camera and Tom would move together, but not rigidly. So Tom could like, you know, he could like kind of sway in the... F- in the frame and work the camera the way he wanted. Was it like a, was it kind of like a snorry cam? I've, I've heard, I've heard that term where it's the camera, you sort of have a, 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 a waist, um, like a, a, a no, belt it's brace not, it's, and the camera kind of sticks yeah. out like this. Yeah, no, it's not. Cause when you do that, what happens then is the camera and you always move together. It's just uh, it's yeah. the same as holding your iPhone out and doing that. Right. Yeah. But yeah. what this rig did was, he and the camera are moving together through space, but he's free to to play the frame. Mm. So he can bend over and he can do all this stuff like that. And the, he'll change position within the frame. Uh, and by rolling him around, what it does is, because he's not walking, you don't have the body language of walking, so you have somebody that's literally like floating, you know, ah, through yeah, space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We put a piece of glass in front of the, of the lens that I had found on the stage. That was one of the few sets we built. Um, I just, I saw it in this like wood frame. I thought it was a prop. So I took the lens out and I put it on the front of the camera and it's what really uh, warped the image and created all that chromatic aberration that you saw, which is, you know, like the color fringing and stuff. Yes. Yes. And, um, and we wheeled Tom around, and he did his acting, and um, it drove her, you know, bananas. So it's sort of the gateway to what, what was the section that's called Dope Life. And I just thought it was really important to get across this idea of Emily, who had resisted his addiction and finally succumbs. And when she succumbs, um, it's at the conclusion of a, there's a scene with them in bed together and they're talking and, and it's, she's fought with him about taking drugs, but now it's like, fuck it. So here I am, I'm taking drugs. Boom. Yeah. And it, to me, it felt like they're going into a rabbit's hole. They're sinking into the abyss. So I knew they were going to be in bed, and, and I, I asked Joe and Anthony if we could build a set, which, you know, should have had like eight-foot ceilings or something like that, this bedroom set. If we could build it all the way up to the the ceiling of this warehouse that we were shooting in. So it wasn't that high. It wasn't as high as I would have liked, but it was a good 16 feet. 16, 18 feet, something like that. So the idea being that the camera is looking down on them. They're lying in the in bed, and the camera's looking down in what we call a top shot, and it and it pulls up and up and up. Now, to feel real, or to feel like you're really in this space, it should stop fairly, you know, fairly soon because it would hit the ceiling. But we keep going like past where the ceiling should be. And what makes it feel that much weirder is it's not like you're going through the ceiling and breaking the fourth wall. 
the walls are like 18 feet high. So mm. the camera is just going and going and going. And you're like, wait a minute, that bedroom doesn't look right. That's yeah, yeah. something is off here. Um, and to me, that was the transition into dope life. Yeah. And dope life for sure is my favorite, just aesthetically. That's it's, it's my favorite chapter of the film. It's, the darkest and it's when he is now, you know, having to become, you know, he, he trying to, he's got to make money in order to feed his addiction and bank robbery is the path he chooses. And, um, it's pretty wild because you're, you're watching the, the creation, you're watching the birth of a criminal throughout mm -hmm. that whole thing, which I think is, it's, it's really interesting because every single chapter you're watching Cherry discover something new about himself. But I think when you are in dope life and you watch him rob his first bank, that discovery, I think, was the most powerful of them all to me. Um, and I want to talk to you about the, the, the technique that you used in making that um, bank teller kind of come out from silhouette. There's a lot of stuff going on in that scene. So, so I, I don't want to overload the question, yeah. but I, I do want to talk about um, how you approached this scene because this was when he finally discovers just how bad he's going to be. And he discovers that he is now a criminal after being a war hero. Well, you know, his first bank robbery happens in a, um, in, in a bank that we visited at the beginning of the film or er, early in the film where yeah. he goes and he tries to cash a check and, uh, or to, to, to settle up, a an overcharge um, and the bank teller is completely unresponsive and he can't get anywhere. And when he does his first robbery, he returns to this same bank. Now the first time he goes in and he's talking to the teller, the teller is just a black void. And the concept of that is that there is this feeling that the world doesn't see him, that he doesn't connect to what people do and who they are. We had a lot of discussions about it being a visual effect and what kind of effect would it be, and we don't want this, we don't want that. But uh, Joan Anthony never quite settled on any visual effect that they thought was going to work for this, this uh, sequence. So on the day that we shot, I still wanted to sort of give a kind of lip service to the um, what was written in the script. And um, I actually found it one of the hardest scenes to light, only in so far as I wanted the environment to feel like it was all lit normally, like it was, you know, the sun's coming in the, the windows and there's a little bit of fluorescent light on. And Cherry's at the at the teller, and the teller's there. But somehow, like, the teller is just absorbing all the light, and like a black hole. Um, and you can't do that by just cutting all the light off of them, because then, you know, you lose the light on the counter in front of her, and you lose the light on her, all her clothes and stuff like that. So it was really more a question of, lighting the, the environment naturalistically and then really cutting any light that would hit her face. Um, but then there's a moment where we decided when she does give the money to Cherry, we would bring the light on her face to see that sort of disappointment. Like, mm. it's almost like, you know. Because she knows him. She's seen him before. She's seen him before. Does she really know him? I, you know, I wouldn't. I well, wouldn't I think what it is, what it is, is that she sees him. Like she sees him for what he is. Exactly. And he, he's he, finally revealed himself to her. Yeah, and it's taken a bank robbery for the world to see Cherry. Now that silhouette, and silhouette isn't even really the best word for it because it's not a traditional silhouette in the way no. you're thinking. Silhouette's it's, easy, you know. I mean, yeah, it's 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 different. I mean, you've completely yeah. taken 
uh, the character has become a black a black void in the in the scene, and it yeah. looks like a visual effect. So it's really interesting to see that you've done that practically. But you also yeah. carry that through in a later scene in the hospital when Emily um, overdoses, and the nurses and doctors are also in that that completely like black void silhouette look. And I was wondering, is it something where? That's how he sees people that he wants things from. Is that is that like wh- what is no, I what think, is his yeah. mindset where where those people that are kind of separating him from in the doctor in the hospital case the person he loves and in the bank case the money he needs is there something there? I think in the in the in the hospital it's much more that he um, it's a very dark moment. I mean she's overdosed on drugs and. He needs these people to save her life, and they're, you know, he feels helpless. So he feels that, you know, th- there is this infrastructure, this hospital, these nurses, these everything, but he can't, um, like, how does he uh, connect? And, like, he needs them, and they just... They want them to get out of the way so they can do what they have to do, which is what you do in a hospital, in an emergency situation. Yeah. Like a, a loved one crying over the, the the patient doesn't really help you medically. Yeah, you know, so, exactly. So, um, but from his point of view, it's like he can't reach, you know, like he's, he's going, he's really at one of his blackest moments, you know, where... He's killed the one he loves, he thinks. 